This video is going to cover section 1.9, inverse functions, and we're almost at the end of chapter 1, okay, functions and their graphs. So we have a definition here um, that says, given a function f that maps the set a to b, so um, x's and y's, okay, the inverse function f of inverse, so this little notation here, this means inverse, okay, maps the set b to a. So it kind of just does a flip. Okay, so this is our function where these guys are matched with these guys. So these x's go with these y's. Then the inverse switches it. So our y's become our, our new x's, okay? And the x's become the new y's, aka the domain and the range just switch places, okay? And there's a few conditions we have to meet for this because sometimes um, you can find the inverse algebraically of a function but if it turns out that the new function that you get is not a function, then it doesn't really have an inverse. Okay, so we'll talk about that in a bit. So here's a really quick example just to kind of demonstrate the, the main idea of an inverse. If f of x has the points negative 5, 2, negative 3, sorry, negative 5, 2, 3, 1, and 7, 5. Okay, so these are all my x's. Okay, then f of inverse of x would have what? Okay. So all we're going to do for this part right here is we're just going to show you how we would find the inverse of this particular set of points, okay? And that would be, let me see, I'm going to go ahead and set up my parentheses first. I want to space here. I'll pretend there's a question mark at the end, okay? And we're just going to switch everything. So all of our y values become the x values, okay? And all of our x values become the y values. You can't see here. Let me rewrite that last point because it kind of came out all distorted. Okay, so all that happens is that the x is in the y switch. And I'm, I'm pretty sure you've, you've seen this before. Okay, so we're going to go into an example. And this is informally. I, I was going to do the algebraic first, but I changed my mind, decided to change it. Okay, so we're going to do informal first, and we'll do algebraic at the end. The informal way to show that something is an inverse, okay, or has an inverse, is the following. And we'll have a more uh, defined uh, theorem in a bit. So first, we need to find f of inverse of x. That's what we're trying to find here. To do that, we find the, comp the composition of f and f of inverse, and then we find the find it backwards, the composition of f inverse of f, okay, and we check, okay, so for this part here, I'll show you how to find the inverse in just a bit, a little bit later, f of inverse of this is going to be uh, x over 7, so just kind of the opposite, okay, we're going to divide instead of multiply, okay, so with that information, and again, I'll show you how to find it algebraically later on in this video, we have to do the composition. So for letter A, I'll put letter A right here. Okay, we're going to do F parentheses F of inverse of X. So this guy here is going to get plugged into F. Okay, so it'll look like this. F parentheses is equal to 7 parentheses. Instead of the x, I'm going to put those parentheses, okay? And inside these x's, some are these parentheses where the x used to be, I'm going to plug in f of inverse, which is x over 7. Okay? So if we work this out, we just put that over 1. So we would get 7 times x is 7x. 1 times 7 is 7. Okay. and those just cross out, so we're left with x. So that means that letter A is equal to x. Okay. Letter B we're going to do here on the side, where it's the same thing, but now it's backwards. So we're going to do f of inverse of f of x. Okay, so we're going to start with, in this case, the this is our inner function. Okay, so it's going to go into this one. So now I'm going to look at this guy here and start with that. 
remember instead of my x i'm going to put just a blank space here for the parentheses and you got to be careful here because the x is on top so our parentheses would be like on top okay i need a seven and inside this parentheses we're going to go ahead and plug in f of x which is 7x so 7x goes here 7x goes here and you can and hopefully some of you are seeing something already here there's a little bit of a pattern okay we can see that the sevens are going to cross out because it's just equal to one so we are left with x as well okay so part b is also equal to x okay to further kind of go into this from the way beginning okay the domain of this function this is just a line right so the domain is all row numbers so i'm going to just put my r for all row numbers because of the space okay the range because again it's just a line is also all row numbers the domain for the for the second function x divided by 7 just means it's a line with a slope of 1 over 7. So it's still all row numbers. And the range is also all row numbers. So in this case, you can see that everything is all row numbers. But if they were anything a little bit different, these two should match. Okay. And these two should match. If this happens, and we also get the composition equal to x in both cases, then they are inverses of each other. Okay, this is the kind of like the proof for inverse. So let me go ahead and do a more formal definition now of this. Okay, here we go. We just kind of showed you an example of how this works. But this says definition using comp composition. Let f and g be two functions. Let me move this up just a little bit. There we go. So we have two functions, f and g, okay, such that f of g of x equals x, okay, and g of f of x equals x. So in the example before, the g of x that we were using, you want to kind of make a note up here, the g of x was our f of inverse. And I'll put prior example. This is just, you don't have to write this if you don't want to, but it, that's what I'm just kind of showing you. So in the one we just did, the little f of inverse of x, that was our g of x in this case, okay? So if this is equal to x and this is equal to x for all x in the domain of each one, okay, and then we can say that they are inverses of each other. And it tells you here, if both conditions are met, then g is the inverse of, s, of f, okay? This is how you prove it. Um, additionally, and here's the, the, the notation we saw down there, okay? Additionally, you have to take note of note two. I'll go back to this one in a bit. The domain of f must be the range of the inverse and vice versa. So that's what I was showing you right now when I did the domain and range for each one. They have to match, okay? And note one is that for the purpose of this class, the negative one power, anytime you see negative one power, we're going to assume that it means inverse. So don't say it's the reciprocal. With exponents, it usually means reciprocal. But when you put it next to an f, like for like a function, we're going to assume it's an inverse. Okay, so just make sure we are aware of that. All right, we're going to go ahead and go on to example number two. And this is saying verify that these two are inverses of each other. Okay, So all we're going to do is we're going to prove that the composition, so f of g of x should come out to x, and g of f of x should come out to x as well. In addition, the domain and the ranges need to, they need to be, um, they need to be the same as each other, but flipped. Okay, so Let's go ahead and do the composition first. So first, okay, we're going to do f of g of x, and we're going to see if that's equal to x, okay? We have to do that first. So let's do that first. We have f is this guy, and I'm just, hopefully this is not going too much out of focus. There we go. So we're going to copy f, so f parentheses, is equal to all this. So my x is just this one part right here. So parentheses minus four divided by seven. Okay. And inside these parentheses, we're gonna put g of x, which is this over here, seven x plus four. 
Okay, so let's simplify this now. We can see that we can take off the parentheses. Okay, the four is equal to zero. So we're left with seven X over seven. The sevens are equal to one because you get seven divided by seven and that is equal to X. So the first one is met. The first condition is met, okay? We're gonna try the second condition now. So now we're gonna do, uh, I should have put that to a pair. We're gonna do G of F of X and see if that's equal to X, okay? So same thing, but now we're looking at this function here. So we have G parentheses, and instead of my X, I'm gonna put a parentheses as well, seven parentheses plus four. Inside that parentheses, I'm gonna go ahead and put all of this. So X minus four over seven goes here, and it also goes over here. Okay, now I'm gonna show you a little bit of a trick here because we have another fraction. Um, and because we're multiplying, okay, there's something you can do that will help us a lot. If you have a whole number or integer like so, and you have, you're multiplying times something with the same denominator, what happens is you're going to have 7 over 1 times this over 7. So we're going to multiply times 7, right? And then divide by 7. So you're kind of doing something um, the same, not the same step, but you're doing double the work. So to save us some time, what we're going to do is we are just going to cross out those 7s because 7 over 7 is 1, and you're allowed to do that. This only works if you're multiplying and dividing, okay? So this is going to be equal to x minus 4 plus 4. We can get rid of the parentheses. We can get rid of the 4s because negative 4 plus 4 is 0. So this is also equal to x. I should have boxed that one too. So we are good to go on the second part. So, so far, both conditions are met. So we're going to say, yeah, they're inverses of each other. We have one final thing to check. Okay. We need to check the domain in the range of each one and make sure that they are opposite of each other. So let's look at our f of x. Remember, f of x was equal to x minus 4 over 7. And we're going to find domain and range for that one. And we're also going to check the domain and range for g of x, which was 7x plus 4. Oh, I cannot draw a straight line. All right. So the domain for this one, again, this is a line because it's x minus, if you, if you separate the 7, you would have x over 7 minus 4 over 7. So it's still a line. So the domain is all row numbers. Okay. You can check it on the graphing calculator if you don't believe me. Again, the range, it's a line, goes on forever. It's also all row numbers. G of X is a little more obvious. You have it in the format of MX plus B. So it's quite obvious that the domain is all row numbers and the range is also all row numbers. So we can see that if we were to match up the domain with the range down here, they are the same. And I even color coded them the same on purpose. And if we match the range with the domain of this guy, they're also the same. So this is what you're matching up. The domain goes with the range of the other, the range goes with the domain of the other. And because we're switching X and Y, it makes sense that the domain and range should be swapped as well. And they should be equal. Okay, so since all these conditions are met, that means that this, these two functions are inverses of each other. And we have just proved it. Okay? It's kind of nice when everything is all the same like that. Let's look at another example. And this time we're going to look at it graphically. Okay? So we have inverses graphically. If f and g are inverses of each other, then for all x and y and f, okay, y of x lies in g. So what that means is that we're going to have this graph, okay, and if you reflect across the identity function, which is y equals x, okay, like so, you should have kind of a matchup, okay, so this number becomes the opposite. You don't change any signs, you're just flipping the x and y. So for instance, if this is a what, 2, 1, this should be, I don't know what point that is. I think I just kind of made it up. But if this was 2, 1, this would have been 1, 2. Okay, I kind of messed up my scale here. Um, we can, let's make it the same. Let's see. This is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So this is 2, 5. 
Uh, I might. I should have probably made my scale a little bit better. Ignore the scale, okay? But pretty much these have to match, okay? Make sure you do a better scale than I do. Let's go ahead and look at an example so I can kind of see a little bit better how this works. It says verify graphically f of x equals 4x minus 1 and g of x equals 1 fourth x plus 1 are inverses of each other. So for, the, for these, let's pretend we didn't want to do all that work that we just did for the previous example. And we just want to look at something and say, well, are they switched or not? Okay, we're going to go ahead and do that. So we're going to grab our graph and calculator, which we should be pretty familiar with by now. If you haven't, you have a test coming up, guys. You might want to start looking at that. Okay, so here's our graph and calculator. There's our y equals. We're going to type in f of x first. So 4x um, minus 1. Make sure we are oh, no, four one. Make sure we are putting a minus and not the negative. Okay, so if you're down here, this is the minus, this is the negative. So there is my function. I'm gonna look at the. I'm, I want to see the table. So table, and you can see we have some values here. Um, I'm just gonna pick. I'm gonna start at negative two. Why not? So let's see. I'm gonna write these values negative two through two. I'll put those ones. Okay, so we have negative 2, negative 9, negative 1, negative 5, 0, negative 1, 1, 3, 2, 7. And I'll just stop there. So what we want to see, if this is in fact an inverse, this table should be swapped. Okay, so let's go ahead and try that one now. So I'm going to go back to my, week, my y equals, and you can put it on y2 if you want. For my purposes, I'm going to just clear this one and put the other one because I don't want to see too many numbers on the screen. It gets a little bit cluttered. So we have 1 fourth. I'm going to put that in parentheses. 1 divided by 4. Oh, um, you have the same problem as I do. You kind of have to push a little bit under the button. Okay. And then parentheses x plus 1. x plus 1. Okay. And then we're going to find the table. So let's see, we are looking for, first of all, negative uh, nine. If this is the case, we're gonna go ahead and copy these values here, and we're gonna see if the values over here match this. So let me do that first, actually, so we're not having to look all over the place. One, three, and seven. All right, so I'm gonna find negative nine first. So I have to go up for that one. And it looks like we have negative two, okay. Then I have to find negative 5, so oh, there it is. So that one's negative 1. Then I'm going to look at negative 1 next. Negative 1 is 0. And then we have 3. 3 is 1. And 7. 7 is 2. All right, so all I did is I just filled out my table. So now we're going to check to see if we have this the opposite thing going on here. So in this one, my domain are these guys, okay? So I see negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, and I see the same thing over here. So, so far, our domain is matching the range for this guy, okay? Now we're gonna check the range for my f of x. So we have negative nine, negative five, negative one, three, and seven, and we can see that it also matches this. So again, this is the kind of matching you wanna see when you're checking for inverses. Okay, or if you wanted to find an inverse, if you had values, you could also just switch them like this way. Okay, that's it for that one. I think we are almost done with about two, three more examples, but they're pretty quick. So here's another way to see if something is a, if something has an inverse to begin with, okay? Because it, it would kind of, wouldn't be no fun if you did all this work and it turns out the domain and the ranges aren't matching, so you did it all for nothing, okay? So there's this method called the horizontal line test, and we go ahead and put HLT for short. It's really similar to the vertical line test, except that now we're gonna do the test across, okay, horizontally. What it does, it says if a function f has an inverse, it has an inverse if and only if there's no horizontal line um, crossing the graph at more than one point. If it passes this test, that means that it's one-to-one, -one, okay? One-to-one -one is exactly what it sounds like. It means that you have one 
range value for one x value. So exactly what it says here, one per each uh, x and y. So let's look at an example. Is y equals x squared one to one, or um, does it have an inverse? Okay, so remember, if it, if it is one to one, then it has an inverse. Yeah. Uh, so let's go to prove this. We're going to use our horizontal line test. So let's see. I'm going to go ahead and just kind of graph it because I know what it looks like. You should know what it looks like by now too. Okay. We know that this graph is a parabola or the squared function. So it kind of looks like this. Okay. And I also know just to kind of pick a few points, I'm going to pick two. Two is equal to four at this point. And I know that negative two is also equal to four. So right off the bat, I can see that it's not going to be one to one because the number four has two different values. Okay. So it's not one to one. Okay. And we can put in parentheses right here. We have negative two comma four and two comma four have same y values. So it is a function, I mean, don't get me wrong, it is a function, it's just not a one-to-one -one function. Okay, so this is why it's not one-to-one. -one. So all you have got to do is show me one example of where it doesn't work, and that will tell me it's not one-to-one. -one. Okay, and this implies that it does not have an inverse. Uh, does not have an inverse. Okay, because if we were to do the other test, the horizontal line test, right, we did this, you see that it crosses two times. So you could also say it fails the HLT. Okay, and that's pretty much it for this one. Let's look at another one, and this one is specifically asking us to do the horizontal line test, which is usually the easier one, as long as you know what the graph looks like. Okay, so now we have is y equals the absolute value of x, one to one. So absolute value is the one that looks like a v, okay, kind of like this. And just by looking at it, you should be able to tell that it's going to fail because if I put a straight line through here, we have a point here and a point here. I'll put a dot instead of an x. So it fails the HLT. So that means that no. It is not one to one. Okay. Hopefully that's not too difficult. So if you're given a figure, this is probably the easiest way to do it, to check if it's going to be one to one and if it has an inverse. Last example. See, this one wasn't, oh, this one was not too long. I'm going to show you how to find an inverse algebraically, which is the first thing I wanted to do because I just think it's pretty simple. Um, so to find inverses algebraically, okay, before we do anything at all, you want to graph it and use the HLT to see if it even has an inverse. Because like I said before, you don't want to do all this work and it turns out the inverse is invalid because the domain and ranges don't match. Okay, So do that first. If it fails, you're done. You don't have to do anything else and you just say it does not have an inverse. Okay. If it does, if it passes this test, then we have to go ahead and start our process. So the first process is to replace f of x with y if there's a y. Sometimes it's, it's y equals, sometimes it's f of x equals. You want to do it with a y, okay? Next step is to switch the x and the y, okay? And then we're going to solve for y, so you want it to look like y equals something. And once you get that final answer, you just kind of make it formal by using this notation instead. So you put your f of inverse of x, and that's the notation for the inverse of this guy. If you have to prove it, okay, if it says prove using, you know, everything you know, then what you want to do is show that the domain of f is equal to the range of the inverse. And that's why for every problem we've done so far, we've kind of shown the domain and the range for each one to show that they're the same, okay? And you could also do it this way where you prove that they're equal to x, the identity function. Do you have to do all this? No, you don't have to do every single thing that's asked. You don't have to do all of these parts. Um, it just depends on the question they're asking. If you have to prove it, though, you do have to do one of them, okay? All right, let's look at this example, and I picked this one on purpose because you're going to have one really similar to it, and it tends to throw people off. So first of all, does this have an inverse? Well, I believe it does, but let's just check to make sure. Okay, so we're going to graph it here. So parentheses 5 minus 3x, 3x, okay? 
divided by parentheses x plus 2. Okay, we're going to graph it. We're just going to see if it passes the horizontal line test. So it looks like it's kind of a, a, a reciprocal function where it has the two curves. Um, and this line right here would be like our asymptote, okay? But it is going to pass the horizontal line test because no matter where I put the horizontal line, it's only going to cross at one point. So it does pass the horizontal line test, which means we need to do the next step. We're going to go ahead and start solving this algebraically. So we, so number one, it passes HLT, which means that it has an inverse, okay? Step number two, we're going to replace this with a Y. So Y equals 5 minus 3X over X plus 2, okay? Step number three is to switch X and Y. So now I'm going to have X equals... 5 minus 3y over y plus 2. Okay. Step number 4 is to solve for y. And I'm just getting these steps from the ones I wrote on top. This is where this particular problem is a little bit tricky because you don't you have two y's. So I'm going to kind of teach you a little method we can do here. And this just depends on the problem because sometimes they're easier, sometimes they're not. Uh, that's a 3. So minus 3y over y plus 2. That's a 3y, okay? So, I hope you don't think it's a 13. What we're going to do is we're going to cross multiply by putting this over 1. Okay? And that's going to give us x times all of this. So, x times y plus 2 equals 1 times 5 minus 3y. We're going to distribute like we would normally would when we see parentheses. So that's xy plus 2x is equal to 5 minus 3y. Okay? And now you can kind of see that I kind of sort of isolated the y a little bit, but I have this 2x. So I'm going to, I remember, I want to get y by itself. So I'm going to do this in steps. I'm going to move the 2x first. I'm going to say minus 2x and then minus 2x. You're going to notice this is a this is kind of a word problem, okay? But there's actually similar problems when you get to calculus. So I'm going to have 5 minus 3y minus 2x. So, so far, we really can't combine anything. We're just kind of writing it out, okay? I'm gonna go ahead and move now the y over here because I want all the y's together. And I really can't combine this just yet, but I can try to get them together at least. So let's add three y to both sides. Okay, so now this is gone. I'm gonna rewrite this. So now this right here is three y plus x y equals 5 minus 2x. Okay. You have to stop the video to see what to kind of look this over and make sure you understand that is perfectly fine. Okay. Here is where we get the interesting step. So now that I have all my y's on one side, I do I can I want to combine them, but I can't because of this x. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to factor. And I'm going to GCF factor which means I'm going to take out the greatest common factor or whatever they have in common. In this case, both 3y and xy have a y, which means I can take out the y and I just write whatever's left over. So I have a 3 plus x. Okay, so think of it like this. If you were dividing 3y by y, you'd be left with 3. If you were dividing xy by y, you'd be left with x. Okay, so this is the same. These two are the same is what I'm saying. If you're not sure, just check y times 3 is 3y. y times x is xy. Okay? Bring down the rest, 5 minus 2x. And we are almost done. You want to get y by itself. So what you're going to do is you're going to divide by all this parentheses here. 3 plus x. 3 plus x. And we have effectively solved for y. So I'm going to go ahead and put this up here because I'm out of space down here. So we have y equals, OK, 
okay? Five, uh, I'll put it right here. Five minus two X over three plus X. Hopefully your function's not as crooked as mine is. Okay, so this is kind of the answer, okay? But we have to, if you want to do it formally, okay, we need to do step number five. So step number five is to change this y into f of inverse. So all I got to do is change the y with that. So five minus two x over three plus x. And this is our official answer. I boxed this one up because we do tend to leave our answer like this. If you do this, I'm not going to count it wrong. Um, but if we do get back on WebAssign, which is probably going to happen this week, you want to be more official and do it this way.